Okay, we're on lesson number six of our winter quarter, and the title of the lesson is Knowing That God Will Act, and it's Psalms 58 through 72, and we will be looking specifically at Psalm 58, Psalm 67, and Psalm 72. So, Lord, we thank you for these psalms, and uh, one of these psalms is a is a curse, and so we pray that you would help us to understand the dispensation we're living in, and that we're not to curse people, but to bless them. And um, anyway, we pray that you would teach us from the psalms today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the first section is judgment against unjust rulers. Judgment against unjust rulers, and that is Psalm 58, verses 1 through 11, which is the entire psalm. So I can start off reading that one. It's for the choir director. Said to Al Tesheth, a Miktam of David. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? No, in heart you work unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear, so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or a skillful caster of spells. O oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O oh Lord. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. So what do you think of that one? Psalm 58.10 has always struck me. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. That sounds a little gross to me. Um, gory. But this is in verses 1 and 2. It says, Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? And then the answer is no. In heart you work unrighteousness, and on earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. So he's speaking of rulers here. Judges or political leaders. In what ways do judges or political leaders partake in injustice or violence? Have you seen that injustice in political leaders? Yeah, we see that a lot, don't we? Yeah, I think of uh, what is going on with President Trump now. You know, Hillary Clinton did exactly the same thing regarding classified documents. And she was not prosecuted. And it was actually... I remember James Comey saying that, you know, no reasonable prosecutor would bring a case like this. And then, of course, with uh, with Trump, they not only bring a case, but they raid his house, the pre-dawn raid with uh, an army. Back That was last August. They, raid, they raided his house. The FBI did it. So it was the law. It was the law being lawless. And, uh, you know, and, and now he has four against him, and they're all trumped up and, and uh, you know, made up. And 
So, you know, if you want, you can prosecute whoever you want for anything, you know, if you make it up. And that's what's going on now. So there is injustice. Um, not so much violence now around in the United States, which I appreciate. Uh, but in Israel, there was violence. You know, Manasseh, it was said, uh, killed all sorts of innocent people. Um, he was a terrible ruler, King Manasseh. So, but you can think of uh, laziness in political rulers, bribe taking, misuse of power. That's what we've been talking about with our Justice Department. Favoritism, again. Uh, the Democrats are favored in the United States over the Republicans. And ignoring of laws, and that is true on the southern border. There are immigration laws on the books that are ignored. And so this psalm is appropriate for today in our own country. Although it's in the wrong dispensation because what David calls upon them is pretty horrendous. So verses 3 through 5 David is speaking of the rulers. He calls them the wicked. They're estranged from the womb. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. So from birth they've been um, lying. And that's true of all of us, really. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear, so they don't want to hear what is right. They, they won't learn what is right so that it does not hear the voice of charmers or a skillful caster of spells. These are people who are set in their wickedness. They don't want to learn uh, the right way. They don't seem to be convicted of sin. Um, and that's a, that is a choice. And this is what happens to people like that. This is Proverbs 29, verse 1. A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. You know, the Lord puts up with it for a while. Um, but the, there comes a time when uh, he won't put up with it anymore. And then verses 6 through 8, David calls for the Lord to act. So, yeah, David calls on God to act. He says, Oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouth, break out the fangs of the young lions. And then he's pretty graphic. Let them flow away like water that runs off. When he aims his arrows, let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts away as it goes along. Well, and if it's, if it's hot and dry, yeah. You know, they leave this trail of slime, and they, and they shrivel up. And like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. So they, David's calling on these rulers to be like uh, stillborn children. So this is calling, David calling for God in the Bible to curse them. So this is what's called an imprecatory prayer, okay? That's when you don't have the power to do anything, so you call on God to curse them. Now, how are we in the church called to deal with people like this? Yeah, we're called to bless them, aren't we? So that's the difference in the dispensations. Okay, that's one of several between David was under the law and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm. Uh, God wrote this psalm. God, through David, wrote this psalm. And uh, 
But what we're to do is to pray for a change of heart for these people. We want to pray for a change of policy. So, for example, you know, I pray for Joe Biden and his administration to change their policy on border enforcement. You know, we would prefer that he would enforce the border because he made a promise to uphold the laws of the country. And we have immigration laws, which he is ignoring. So, he, um, so we pray for that, that he would enforce the laws that are on the books. Um, we pray that he would not lie, which he tends to do. Um, but do we pray that he dies? Do we pray that, you know, terrible things happen to him? No, we don't do that. We pray, he says he's a Catholic, and so, you know, I know some Catholics are saved because you're saved by believing in Jesus. There's a lot of false teaching in the Catholic Church. But I know many Catholics that are saved, or have known many Catholics that are saved. So we pray for his salvation and that he would follow the Lord, and so be blessed. And we want to pray that for all unjust rulers in the church age. So then, you know, I had somebody come, I think it's been more than a year now, come to prayer meetings. She said that a friend of hers was praying curses on people because she was reading these psalms, these imprecatory psalms. And uh, she knew that that was wrong to do as a church age believer. So, and we, I, you know, pointed out some verses for her. No, she wasn't doing it. Her friend was, who was a new believer. She just didn't know, you know, she just needed to learn. And so, yeah, we pray for blessing and salvation for uh, people who are evil. And in this case, it's uh, specifically rulers who are evil. Then verses 9 through 11, Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. So the Lord eventually will do that to people like this if they refuse, just like the psalm said, Psalm 29, when, you know, if... Uh, people don't listen to the Lord's promptings, eventually the Lord will bring judgment on them. And that's a certainty. At the appropriate time, in his time, he will bring uh, judgment. And so we pray that these people would change their mind before that judgment comes. But then verse 10 my favorite verse, the righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. <laughs> I think that is so great. <laughs> the, uh, it's like something out of Conan the Barbarian, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, the Lord, when it's appropriate, he will do that stuff. You know, you read about Revelation where uh, blood up to the horse's bridles for 200 miles. Um, and that is because people refuse to repent. They just refuse to repent, you know, and eventually the Lord has to deal with them. So that will happen. And we don't want stuff like that to happen to people. We'd rather have them change their mind. And then verse 11, And men will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. We pray for people to change their behavior, and we pray for them to be saved when we see uh, evil rulers. So anything about that imprecatory psalm? So the quarterly skips over a bunch of psalms, so I kind of scanned through them. Psalm 59, verse 10 says, my God in his loving kindness will meet me. God will let me look triumphantly upon my foes. So that if you're following the Lord, the Lord will protect you. And uh, 
eventually you'll look triumphantly upon your foes. You don't have to bring it about. You just follow him. Psalm 60, verses 11 and 12. Oh, give us help against the adversary, for deliverance by man is in vain. Through God we shall do valiantly, and it is he who will tread down our adversaries. The kings of Israel had a tendency to go to other nations for help. They would go to Egypt, they would appeal to Syria or to Assyria, and that is not what the Lord wanted. The Lord wanted them to come to him. And so when he, they would pray, and sometimes the good, good kings would pray and seek the Lord when they were in trouble, the Lord would deliver them. If they went to other nations, they ended up losing and things like that, you know. And we need to remember that. Um, we need to rely on the Lord for our problems, too, and he will deliver us. So then the next psalm, Psalm 61, verses 1 and 2, Hear my cry, O God, give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you, and my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I think there's a song that goes like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what is that saying? That's saying you can pray to God no matter where you are on earth, and he will hear you. And uh, we want to be praying. Then Psalm 62, uh, verse 5. My soul wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold, I shall not be shaken. On God my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. The biblical way of doing things is to place all your eggs in one basket. And that's the Lord. The Lord is the basket. You don't put your eggs anywhere else. Because he is reliable and he is always going to come through. Um, if you put your eggs, you know, if you try to split the difference and scatter things out, you know, like uh, like in investing, you diversify, <laughs> it's no good. And in the religious world, that's called syncretism. Syncretism, that's mixing faiths. You know, the Lord hates that because there's not another God. There's only one God. <laughs> And the other faiths are all aimed at Satan, you know, anything except for biblical Christianity. So you want to put all of your eggs in one basket, and you trust in that, and the Lord will take care of it. We're making our way to our next psalm we're doing. The quarterly skip to like a thousand psalms. Yeah, only the other important ones. So then Psalm 63 and verse 4 says, So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Now this is something that I need to remind myself. You know, I, I'm always asking for blessing from God. I frequently forget to bless him. You know, because I think, well, he doesn't need blessing. He has everything, you know. but. Um, the Bible is very clear that blessing God is a good thing to do. You know, bless him for, you know, who he is. Bless him for what he's done. Bless him that he takes care of you. Bless him for the future that you have in him. Um, we have a great future in him. Yeah, because the recipient appreciates it. And so the Lord appreciates it too. So Psalm 65 and verse 9, You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. 
you prepare their grain, for thus you prepare the earth. So the Lord causes prosperity. So if you want prosperity, you follow the Lord. You know, Jesus said something about that. Seek first. Yeah, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yes, and everything will be added to you. The things that we, you know, care about, we are concerned about, he will give to you as a side measure. Then Psalm 66, 3 and 4, Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you. What's feigned obedience? Feigned, F-E-I-G-N-E-D, feigned. Huh? Faked. They will give faked obedience to you. Yeah, that's feigned obedience. Yeah. Right. And then verse 4 says, All the earth will worship you and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name. So what is this psalm? Talking about, say to God, how awesome are your works, because the greatness of your power, your enemies will give feigned obedience to you, but all the world, earth will worship you. You know, there's a time when Jesus will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. That's coming. We look forward to it greatly. And all the earth will worship him. But not all the earth will do it from the heart. And, uh, you know, some will ha give feigned obedience because there will be a price to pay if they don't obey. And I think later in the lesson, I, I, yeah, later in the lesson we'll read what the price is. But, so this is a prophecy of the Messiah's reign. The whole earth will worship him, but not everybody will believe it. <laughs> you know, not everybody will believe it. Some will do it in a grumbling fashion, you know. And that's why there's that last great battle in Revelation 20, after the millennial kingdom, when Satan is led out of his hole. And he stirs up all these people who are giving this feigned obedience, you know, to attack the capital of the world in Jerusalem. And, you know, the Lord just, he says, okay. And he blows them all up. <laughs> Fire comes down from heaven and destroys them, you know, because they've had a thousand years. What righteous rule. Yeah. Yeah. Just immense prosperity, you know, and wonders and, you know, just amazing. And they reject it. Okay, so that's our first section and all the intervening psalms <laughs> with like one verse pulled out. So the next section, section B, is blessed to be a blessing. That is Psalm 67. It's seven verses. Can I get somebody to read Psalm 67? Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a short little one, isn't it? So verses 1 and 2, God be gracious to us and bless us. Notice that we don't know the author of this psalm. Just for the choir director with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. So God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. So is it right to ask for blessing from God? You know, this is uh, reminds you of the blessing that the priests gave Israel. It's in number 6, uh, verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. This is very reminiscent of that. 
Yeah, and I mean, look at the people who live in Islamic countries now. Many times they lose their job if they uh, convert and things like that. So, and and the Lord will support people even in you know dire circumstances. And we see that with the uh, the captives from Judah in Babylon. You know Daniel and his friends. Um, you know, they prospered in Babylon, even though they were threatened. Their lives were threatened <laughs> several times. Um, yeah, I think, and, you know, this is in Israel, they're saying this. Be, God be gracious to us, the nation of Israel. Cause his face to shine upon us, why? That your way may be known on the earth. You know, Israel does shine a light on God because of their miraculous existence, even now, you know, after they've, you know, they were scattered for 2,000 years, and yet their culture did not disappear. And now they've been reborn as a nation after 2,000 years, and they're being prospered right now, even in unbelief. They're in unbelief, and yet, they are prospering. Why? That your way may be known on the earth. Your salvation among all nations. You know, and I think, you know, in a country like ours where Christianity is not persecuted yet, this is true also. You know, people who follow the Lord tend to be more prosperous than those who do not. Uh, the Lord blesses them are improved yeah yeah and so you know god is the god of israel but he wants all peoples to praise him he's not just the god of israel he's the god of everyone uh, he created israel to be a light to the world uh, but he wants everyone to worship him because he is God and there is no other one. He does deserve our praise. So verse 3, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Now that will come in the millennium and on into eternity. Then let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded. Okay, that's as far as I'm going. And the peoples will all praise him because, in verse 4, you will judge the peoples with uprightness. You know, we just talked about in Psalm 58 about the unjust rulers. And we made the example of our own government and some of the un injustices. Um, in the rulership of our own government. Um, peoples will praise him because his rule will be perfect. There will not be any injustice at all. Some people won't like that, <laughs> you know, because they can't get away with anything. <laughs> but uh, that is why people will praise him. You know, God is the, is the standard. You know, when people say, oh, I'm okay, I'm a good person, they're using the wrong standard. The standard is him. So when you say you're a good person and then you compare yourself to Jesus, who is God in the flesh, you say, well, I'm not that good. <laughs> you know, um, because, and that is the standard that we're to, to line ourselves up against, and that is why we need a Savior. Because when we take that standard of Jesus and we line ourselves up against that, we don't make it. Can't make. Can't make it. You hit it or you miss it. And that's right. Unless you're Jesus, you miss it. <laughs> you just miss it. You know. And uh, that is why we need Him, because in Him we have salvation. So and and He. We'll take care of it. So then I, I wrote something in here. How do you involve yourself in the Great Commission? 
Um, something about this psalm made me think of that. <laughs> well, basically the fact that all peoples are to praise him. All peoples are to praise him. And that's one of the main focuses of the church is to introduce people to Jesus. That's one of our three missions that we're to be doing. We're to be glorifying God, how we live our lives and, and in worship. We're to be teaching the saints, edifying the saints, have people grow up into mature Christians, and evangelizing the lost. That is, that is the whole mission of the church. So we, each, each of us need to have some kind of plan to tell people about Jesus. And I, f I fade on this. I go up and down. Yeah, I, I think when you're going through tr trials, you need to know, let, let others know that you're hanging on to him also. Yeah, that's true. You know, when we go through hard things, that's a, that is also a place where we can uh, lead people to Christ. You know? And I think that's more powerful than when things are going good for us. And we're thanking the Lord. I think that's more powerful. Yeah. So anyway, we want to think about, and I'm I'm talking to myself too, about how we can involve ourselves in the Great Commission. You know, I go on to this Need Him website. Um, probably not enough, but I go on there and talk to people about the Lord from all over the world. It's really a great opportunity. So then, uh, verse 6 and 7, the earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. So this is the nation of Israel. This is a psalm of the nation of Israel. And they are blessed because the true God is their God. And what did God tell Abraham when he chose him to form this nation? I'll read it to you. <laughs> That's Genesis 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. So he's going to bless Abram personally and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. You know, and Dane has taught us that the Hebrew there says that is a command. He says, I will bless you, so you go be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, you will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So, and that has happened, you know, because. What has come through the Jews? The Bible, for one. Uh, the Savior and the coming kingdom is coming through the Jews. And through this, all families of the earth will be blessed. And, you know, you know the church was an outspring of the nation of Israel. Nation of Israel was started, or the Christianity was started by the Jews, and it very rapidly turned into a Gentile project, because most of the Jews rejected their Messiah. So, so they were blessed to be a blessing, and that's true of us also. That's true of us. Okay, so now they skipped a bunch of Psalms again. So Psalm 68, 6 says, God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. So you don't have to be lonely even if you live alone because God is with you. Um, somewhere it says, and I don't remember where, it's in the Psalms that God will create a family. You know, that's what he did with Susanna and I. We're, you know, 
we created a family because we got married and then we adopted kids. You know, Alex has the same situation, really. And so God has created a family. So when you have the Lord, there's no need to be lonely because you have the church too, right? So you need, you know, we we tend to need physical pe- physical beings, you know. The Lord can keep you company, you know, if you're alone. He does, he can, and he does. But um, it does help to see other people in bodies that you could touch, <laughs> and that's that's the church. Yeah, the church will supply that for you, um, which the Lord supplies. Then Psalm 69, verse 6, May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me, O Lord God of hosts. May those who seek you not be dishonored through me, O God of Israel. Now that's a prayer of mine. I want to be faithful because a uh, believer who falls takes down others with him. No. A believer who falls into sin. And, uh, you know, I've had more than enough sin in my life. I don't need to increase that. So i that's a prayer of mine. May those who wait for you not be ashamed through me, O oh Lord. Help me to be uh, faithful and to not give up. And we need the Lord's help to do that. You know, he will give us the the strength to do that. So Psalm 70 and verse 2 says, Let those be ashamed and humiliated who seek my life. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. So that's kind of an imprecatory prayer, right? He says, you know, get them, Lord, when they come after me. Protect me and make it boomerang on them. Yeah. And uh, and then Psalm seventy one, uh, verses nine, verse nine says, "Do not cast me off in the time of old age; do not forsake me when my strength fails." Verse eighteen says, "And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come." But you don't really retire when you're a believer. You know, you get older, you don't really retire because you can still serve the Lord. And you want to pass the faith on to the next generation before you, you know, leave this mortal coil, basically. So, and then there'll be a reward in the end. Okay, so now we're on section C, a righteous reign. And that is Psalm 72, 1 through 7. Want me to read that one? I'll read that one. Of Solomon, give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your afflicted with justice. Let the mountains bring peace to the people and the hills in righteousness. May he vindicate the afflicted of the people, save the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. Let them fear you while the sun endures, as long as the moon, throughout all generations. May he come down like rain upon the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and abundance of peace, till the moon is no more. So this is a prayer for the king. I have a, Dane lended me a commentary by Arno Gabelin, who says the Hebrew of this um, a lot of people say Solomon wrote this. He says that this was written to Solomon by David because the Hebrew is to Solomon. And also in verse 20, it says, The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So, you know, in this commentary, he says, This is written to Solomon by his father. So, why is it a good idea for believers to pray for political leaders? Yeah, we talked about that before, about the unjust leaders, right? First Timothy chapter 2, 
verses 1 and 2 says, First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So, yeah, we pray for the leaders so that they will leave us alone. That's why we pray for them, because we want to lead a, uh, a tranquil and quiet life. We don't want them chasing us and throwing us in jail. <laughs> A tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. That's why we pray for, yeah, that's why we pray for our leaders. And uh, and we want them to be saved, too, you know, and have the blessing of that. So how often do we pray for our leaders? I I, I pray for them often. Sometimes I pray the imprecatory prayers. <laughs> but which you yeah yeah so um but i do pray for their uh, policies to be changed if i disagree so then verse two may he judge your people with righteousness and you're afflicted with justice that's what we want that's what jesus will do perfectly this is not happening now um, you know, I think sometimes it happens, but it's a uh, pretty hit and miss right now. But this is describing the Messiah, which we see back in verse eight. You know, um, Solomon was at the beginning was a pretty was a good king. Uh, after he had too many wives, he turned into a less good king, and. Uh, you know, turned really into a bad king because he was a terrible idolater at the end of his reign. But he started out as a good king. So verses 5 to 7 speaks of the length of his reign. In his days may the righteous flourish in abundance of peace till the moon is no more. That's a long time. May he also rule from sea to sea. That's the breadth of his kingdom worldwide. And from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, so that is the Messiah's reign. And verse 9, well, section D is a successful king. Somebody want to read 8 through 20 of Psalm 72. Uh -oh. Right. Yeah, so this is the end of book 2 of the Psalms. It's divided into five books. This is the end of book 2. And at the end of each section, there's a doxology. This doxology is, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone works wonders, and blessed be his glorious name forever, and may the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So each section of the Psalms ends with something like that. But his rule is to be worldwide. We see that in verse 8. Verse 9, he may have enemies, but they will be subjugated. Let the nomads of the desert bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. We talked about that before. That's feigned obedience, right? People will give him feigned obedience. That means he will force them. Well, this is what happens because you'll have to go to Jerusalem to worship. And if you don't, I'm not sure if just uh, representatives of your nation will have to do this or if everybody will have to do this, but this is from Zechariah 14, verse 17. It will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain. On them. If the family of Egypt does not go up and, or enter, then no rain will fall on them. It will be the plague with which the Lord smites the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feast of Booths. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not go up to celebrate the feast of Booths. So maybe in the future Egypt will try this. 
and they'll get a year of drought after that. But anyway, that's why in several several places in the millennial kingdom, Jesus will rule with a rod of iron because the sin nature will still be there in the mortals will be there in immortal bodies uh, but the mortals will have a sin nature and they will have to decide do I believe in Jesus or not and the ones who do not will still worship and they will still obey but they will not want to and so it will be done by force and that's what you know Philippians chapter 2 talks about all will bow down to him to Jesus not all will want to um so anyway that's the end of our lesson we're at the end of book 2 of the psalms so lord we thank you for these psalms uh, thank you for these wonderful prayers and they they give us prophecy too and so it's interesting to look at those and we pray that we would uh, draw people to Jesus through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.